We are here this afternoon to have a session on the, our discussion on the World Bank, lands, Landscape Programs in Action, Experience from the Field. I should have introduced myself. I'm Garo Batman, and I'm the lead uh, for forests and the landscapes at the World Bank. And we want to present you the landscape approach here. And our goal is to present examples from different countries. Uh, before we go to the different countries, I would like to invite uh, our senior Director for Environment and Natural Resources Global Practice, Karen Kemper. You have heard her before in the plenary uh, yesterday, hopefully. And she will make some opening remarks. And then we go for the presentations. Karen, please. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, talking about resilience, usually in here in Germany, the the resilience we try to create is with a Sunday coffee cake, but I didn't see any of that. So that's, that's a pity because you would be even much more resilient and rewarded for coming to this session. So since we don't have the Sunday coffee cake, um, we'll give you great presentations from um, our invitees. And let me tell you a bit what this session is about. Um, uh, by now, um, we are all aware of the many benefits, obviously, of an integrated landscapes approach and how it offers to tackle rural development challenges and creating robust uh, rural landscapes that benefit both people and the economy and the environment. But then we know that implementing such landscapes approaches is really not easy. And you don't only need the technical expertise to do it, but you need political commitment, coordination across sectors, stakeholder engagement, financial resources, and so on. So there's a lot of institutional and political issues that also need to be in place and not only the technical know-how. And so we have organized this discussion forum to create an opportunity to hear from our country partners and from team leaders um, in the World Bank about how they have brought the landscapes approach that we've all been talking about here to fruition and also to talk a bit about the obstacles that they have encountered and how they have overcome them along the way. At least we hope they have overcome them. So we'll hear from three different experiences today, um, from fr one from the Zambezia province of uh, Mozambique, one from the Cerrado forest of Brazil, and then one from 19 states in Mexico. And these are areas where landscapes approaches really have taken hold and uh, where we can see how these innovative ways of dealing with them can benefit uh, stakeholders. Now, we are not only... Um, supporting countries with resilient landscapes, but we are also trying to bring in additional sources of funding. So part of it is through World Bank um, loans and um, concessional credits, but we are also helping countries to access funding like from the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, the FCPF that many of you know, the um, Forest Investment Program, that's the FIP, the uh, Bio carbon fund, from Profor, from the GEF, and also from private sector partners. So all of the cases that you'll hear about today will feature different um, ways of combining a number of different funds. And you will see that in the end, quite different interventions come out of it. Because when you bring in the private sector, you can do uh, different things from um, if you only have public money. And if you have a carbon angle on it, you can also benefits from, benefit from carbon flows, which is different from if you do um, a, a, a typical say, rural development project and so on. So we, we hope that you'll enjoy it. Um, the bank has a forest action plan that we passed in 2016. We are working hard on fulfilling our commitments under that plan. Um, the, um, our funding has, um, our portfolio has increased from $1.8 billion to $2.3 billion in forests, and we are continuing to enhance that, and that, of course, is both on the forest and on the landscape side. So um, I very much look forward to uh, the discussion today, the presentations and discussions, and I turn it back to Garo to move us along in the session. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, now we're going to, as Karen said, we're going to have examples from Brazil, from <coughs> Mozambique, and from Mexico. And the way we're going to do this is uh, pairs. We're going to have one person from the World Bank try explaining briefly the overall framework, and then one person from the field give an example of one of the projects in the framework. Uh, so <coughs> without further ado, I'll invite to come here to the podium. Uh, we start with the, I'll put in the right order. We start with Bernadette Lange, Senior Environmental Specialist from the World Bank. <coughs> she, she's been working on biodiverse and natural resource <laughs> and development. Uh, she worked before at WWF and UNEP, and she's been leading our program in Cerrado for many years now. Please, take your seat. Yep. Uh, uh, our main partner there is the Forest Service, so I'd like to invite Janaina Rocha. She's an uh, executive manager of the, of the, in the Brazilian Forest Service. She's a forest engineer, and she's been working for many years now in environmental regula uh, regularization of rural properties and implementation of the forest code. And she works very closely on integrated management of landscapes and special territory planning, which is what we do here. Welcome, then. Uh, next, I would invite uh, our natural resource management specialist in Mozambique, João Moura Esteves. Very long name, I'm just going to keep it in Esteves, okay? Estevão, Estevão yep. Uh, she, he, is, he is based in Maputo, Mozambique. He used to work in the Brazilian Cooperation Agency, and she, he's been working on all the projects we have there on landscape approach as well. <laughs> <clears throat> Our main partner there is in the Mozambique National Sustainable Development Fund, and we have Farouk Shafin, we have the, here with us. He lives in the Zambebi province of North Mozambique in Mokuba, and she, he is leader, leading the integrated landscape management program we have with them. Come. <laughs> Finally, in the Mexico, I would like to invite <coughs> Katarina Sigmund, environmental specialist from the World Bank, She's based in our office in Mexico as well. She, he's, she's working in the bank since 2013. She works, uh, she works in, in every single forest project in there. I cannot make the list. Uh, and uh, she works on the landscape program as well. And finally, I would like to invite Eduardo Juarez Mejia. Okay. Senor Eduardo Juarez Mejia, he's the general director of FINDEC. He, he's an agronomist by training. He used to work in the government, but his role here is a general director of Findeca. Findeca is a, basically is a, manages a co-op of coffee producers in the state of Oaxaca in southern central part of Mexico and working with 4,000 uh, small producers. And we have you here for organic shade coffee. And I'll tell you, the coffee is very good. Thank you. And, and you hear a Brazilian saying that the coffee is very good, it's because it is very good, okay? Uh, so without further ado, we start with Bernadette explaining the framework for Brazil, for Serrano. We have a presentation. And okay. Just to remind all, sorry, I should have reminded, just to remind all of you, Eduardo is going to present in Spanish, so in case you need translation, there is uh, headsets and the translator equipment right there on the first table, so between now and when Eduardo speaks, please get your translation equipment. Okay, thank you, sorry. Okay, and that's it, okay. Uh, okay, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to have opportunity to talk a little bit about a different biome in Brazil. We are not talking about the Amazon. Amazon is the most famous biome in Brazil, and it's really important. But in the case of Brazil, we have much more than Amazon. And since we start to think about the country, we need to have a different approach. Why different approach? Because, okay. Because we are talking about 
25% of Brazil, 24, 25% of Brazil. It's the middle of Brazil. It's a kind of savanna and forest is where we have a most important area for production. We have 33% of our PIB that it's in Cerrado. We have more than 1 million private pro properties. So we are talking about one area with people, with large, small, medium farms, with soya beans, with cattle ranching, with protected areas also, with indigenous areas also, with traditional communities. But we are talking about one area that it's really important for Brazilian economy. So we need to change our speech. We need to discuss we are with our different stakeholders. We need to discuss about economy. We need to discuss about livestock. We need to discuss about cities, water, land use, land occupation, land planning. And with the experience that we had in Amazon during more than 20 years, around 10 years ago, we start to discuss the Cerrado biome approach. Meaning, it's not enough doing our uh, twin goals to work with poverty eradication and with shared prosperity. We need also to put environment and production in the middle of the table and try to discuss with uh, economic stakeholders, with governments. So we add five different uh, lines of work or strategy to work with the government, including the NDC support for Brazil. Brazil has a quite um, challenged NDC strategy. So the bank decided to work with the supporting the Brazilian government to achieve their NDC goals. To promote environment compliance, Brazil has one of the most amazing forest code in the world. And this forest code is quite different because they establish that each private property in the country needs to have at least 20% of the property with natural vegetation. This is mandatory and this is complex because there is many properties that they don't have this total amount. So we need to work with this, these guys. Uh, the third line is promote intensification of land use in clear the areas. Why? Because we have around 52% of the Cerrado remains with natural vegetation. By law, they could deforestation in a legal process. More around 30%. It's a lot. It's a huge area. Meaning we need to find a way to keep the, these areas that are allowed to produce as natural vegetation, and at the same time, these guys need to make money, okay? To do this, we need to improve the local capacity at the state levels, at municipal levels, and at the government levels to work and to strengthen their capacity to leading with license process, with monitoring, with uh, stakeholder engagement, communication. So they really need their capacities more, with more skills, with increasing staff, with increasing equipment to do that. And of course, they need to make sure that the protected areas and indigenous lands, they are in place, not only in the paper, but they are in paper and in place with all the infrastructure that it's necessary. Doing that work, currently we are working with, with four different ministries, meaning we are putting together agriculture and environment in the same project. We are working with these guys saying we can do this together. And at the same time, we are working with state levels. So we are working at federal level, state level, with many different implementing the agencies. I know that there is a lot of acronyms. You don't need to know all these <laughs> agencies, but it's important to mention. We are talking about around 
12 different implementing agencies, including institutions as GIZ, that it's a cooperation, international cooperation agency, that it's working with the government with all others' projects. So we are putting together not only our partners from the government, but we are trying to really have a integrated approach, including adding other donors, other cooperation agencies, other supporting banks. And as Karin mentioned, we are working with different instruments. Uh, as the first investment program, currently it's an important program as part of our portfolio. We are working with uh, specific single donors as DEFRA. We just finished uh, quite a huge program with DEFRA, working with different projects, including environment compliance. We work with multi-sectoral loans because Normally, the, the states, they don't ask for a loan on environment, but we can put environment as part of multi-sectoral load. So we have transport loans with a, a component for license and improving the quality of the states. So we are, we are putting the environment as part of the multi-sectoral loans. Uh, we are doing, uh, dealing also with trust fund facilities as the NDC facility, that it's a trust fund to support the government, and also doing analytic studies to make sure that we are doing our best with the best methodology and with the best that, data that are available. Currently, we have around a uh, little bit more than $100 million committed with this program. It's not enough, but it's a good start. And we can work this for the next few years to improve and to leverage more money. And that's it. <laughs> Janaina, if you come and I'll give an example. As you saw, we have four different ministries. We cannot have four ministries and everybody in each one of those agencies speaking. So we have in Janaina, which is the basis of it, which is the environmental cadastre. Thank, Thank you, Janaina. I have a presentation too. Thank you. Okay, um, about all initiatives uh, um, Bernadette talk about, we will, uh, I will uh, explain about one plan with um, seven projects in this plan, uh, financial uh, by SIF um, uh, in the forest investment program in Brazil. Uh, this program is, is co coordinator coordinate by, um, by Ministry of Environment, but we have so many, many institutions, uh, public and private, and uh, um, um, NGOs too. Uh, the focus of this investment is combat of deforestation and forest degradation in Cerrado Biome too. Uh, the goal is, is catalyze the policies uh, to provide um, uh, in, increase the the, the uh, funds to facilitate and uh, reduction of deforestation and forest degradation. Provide also funding for public and private, private sectors and um, to enab enable more sustainable management uh, forests in Cerrado Biome and contribute, contribute to, uh, to the reduction of emissions um, and uh, uh, maintain the carbon stocks in Cerrado Biome. <coughs> Uh, about the uh, specifically about the uh, goals to, uh, of the Brazil investment plan, we have the the, the five uh, goals uh, to promote promoting sustainable land use and improve the forest management, contributing to reducing pressure pressure uh, to conversion conversion of land use on remain forests and decrease the emission of greenhouse gases. 
and uh, increase to uh, CO sec CO2 sequestration rates in Cerrado. Um, uh, to I, I thought about this. Uh, we have today um, seven projects. Uh, five of these projects uh, supported and coordination and in uh, about coordination and execution uh, from federal government. Um, and one project uh, is specifically to provide sub-projects sub to directly with the traditional peoples. And uh, one project uh, for the private, private sector uh, is the Macauba project to produce biofuel to plants uh, from uh, uh, fruit of the, the, the tree, palm tree, uh, native uh, Cerrado biome. Okay, I show to you uh, 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 same maps and, f uh, and the photographs about the execution of these projects. Uh, all these projects have our, our, our only one coordination is another project uh, with uh, um, a few resource, a financial resource, but it's very important because all the, the projects can, can uh, uh, catalyze your, uh, our actions and our goals. Uh, this project um, uh, is with the agriculture uh, and the small and medium, medium farmers in the Cerrado biome to increase techni techniques to, to low carbon agriculture methods. And this is FIPCAR Cerrado project. This project uh, um, uh, uh, work with the state uh, environmental agencies to map all the biome, each by each property, rural properties, to plan the land use and monitoring deforestation and increase the carbon stocks. This is the <coughs> municipalities with uh, uh, this FIPCAR project. Uh, so, uh, some photographs about the, the training environmental agencies in the, each state. In Cerrado Biome, we have 11 states, 10 plus uh, uh, federal district. This one is about the forest inventory, national forest inventory of the Brazil in Cerrado Biome. Um, this is this, the publications, yeah, one by one. And this, this one is with the, the National Institute to, to Special Research uh, to monitoring the, the fire and uh, um, deforestation in all Cerrado Biome. Same scenes and maps to, to, to work this monitoring project. Simulation of detect detection fire and adjust the models for this. Spreading the model for detection fire. And this one is DGM, uh, is specifically on the, our, our plan to traditional communities on the Cerrado biome. Some pictures. And each uh, tag is, is each community um, uh, has been provided the, the, the resource to projects in Cerrado Biome from GGM initiative. And this one is Macauba project to produce uh, biofuel to planes from this, this palm tree and uh, from fruit of the this palm tree. Is it? Thank you. Thank you, Janaina. Uh, we now move from the Cerrado of Brazil. We move to the continent and from a middle income country, we go to a, a more poor country. And we're gonna go over East Africa, Southeast Africa, 
uh, with Mozambique, but focusing on Zambezi. João, please. So the first thing to say is that um, integrated landscape management is a very structuring concept for a portfolio in Mozambique. We're currently working across six landscapes, but probably Zambezi program is the most complex one in terms of range of activities and in terms of range of actors with whom we work and instruments. So Zambezi is located in central northern Mozambique, is the second most populous province in the country. It, uh, it has a lot of potential for forestry and agriculture. It also has very important natural resources, including biodiversity hotspots such as the Gilet National Reserve and Mount Namuli. The program, which is managed by the Ministry of Land, Rural Development and Environment, could be the Mozambique Ministry of Landscapes, spans nine districts of this province, more or less five million hectares, 2.3 million people, most of whom are poor and rural. It's a forest landscape with more than 3 million hectares of forests. And deforestation is pretty high, uh, 23,000 more or less hectares per year, which is equivalent to 1.5 times the city of Bonn. Um, slash and burn is the, is the biggest deforestation driver, smallholder agriculture, but there are other degradation drivers, such as charcoal making, illegal logging, underlying causes such as poor governance, land tenure security, etc. So the Zambezi program is, is the entry point of sustainable value chain development in forestry and agriculture value chains, but the range of activities is enormous. We go from spot rehabilitation of roads to market access to things like improving conservation area management. Here are just a few of our early achievements with the first agricultural season last year. We're running into our second. I just wanted to highlight here the land work that we've been doing in recognizing uh, land rights at community level, but also individual plot level. This really creates the social infrastructure for all the rest of the work that we do in terms of income generation, sustainable value chains, and natural resource management. Uh, one thing that I'm very excited about is the training on spatial uh, planning and land management we've been doing. For the first time this year, the cycle we used only data generated in the program. So we work with district level officials uh, with data that has been very local and it makes it very concrete for them how they can apply and use for their own decisions. Um, it would be basically impossible to navigate the complexity of so many activities and so many actors without a multi-stakeholder landscape platform. There is one there, it's the Zambez Integrated Development Platform, which evolved throughout the years. It first started as a forum focused on Red Plus issues and now became a quite sophisticated platform that has a rotating presidency across stakeholder type, going from government to uh, private sector, uh, civil society academia, a coordination council that meets quarterly, uh, thematic groups that meet sometimes monthly and a general assembly that meets once a year. And this is really the foundation that helps to coordinate all these activities and actors across the landscape for implementation of the program. This wasn't built in one day, so this is very important. Uh, it took quite a few years to put these things together and it's something that is still evolving throughout time. And it also comprises a many range of instruments. I think all the instruments that Karin uh, uh, mentioned from FCPF to FIP financing to concessional uh, financing from uh, the World Bank to analytical work and including other partners is there and we have a package that tries to harmonize this including other investments in the landscape from the private sector. One famous one with whom we work a lot is, uh, is a big investment in a plantation company, a Portuguese plantation company called Porto Cell. Uh, just to highlight and finalize some insights you know, related to the challenges that we have, I think on institutions uh, gaining and sustaining trust is something that is a challenge and you have to dedicate resources to that, and it's a continued um, uh, challenge, but you really have to focus and have um, uh, people committed on the ground to coordinating this program. In terms of instruments, um, you know, framing as under one program is very important. You have many instruments, many names. You know, the more the names, the more confused the local actors get, so having one program is key. I think this is also a sewer challenge for us because, of course, some reporting requirements, fiduciary management, occurs at the instrument level, but it's really important to have this program as one. Testing and tweaking has been key for us in the implementation of this program, uh, especially on the value chain finance side. We have a partial credit guarantee uh, mechanism. We have you know, a matching grant system. We've been tweaking a lot during the early implementation of the program. And last, um, I think leveraging entry points. Uh, for us, something that we realized quite quickly during the design of the program is that what got people excited was actually sustainable value chain development. And we've been doing our, you know, our best to embed natural resource management and other landscape management issues within those. Just 
One example is when we finance a business that's primary production, farming for instance, um, we look at the plots and help them identify priority areas for restoration. And the restoration of these areas with support from the program uh, is a requirement to access the funding. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, for this overview and already laying out the challenge. Maybe you can ask Farouk to come here and give an, one of the examples directly from the field. Thank uh, you. I also have a presentation. Uh, first of all, Oh, uh, some guys outside ask me, you are from Ethiopia? I said, no, please. I am really, really Mozambican, please. <laughs> yes. Thank you, this is my, my presentation. Uh, it's a Zambeza landscape. For me, field work is the most important thing. We have uh, uh, investors, we have uh, different stakeholders, but if you don't work in the field, we can do nothing. We are just spending money there. And this is an example of what I am doing. I will say I because I am straight with my community there and different stakeholders. This is the diagram that I, want, I would like to show everyone and everywhere. Let's imagine that. I am speaking English now with you. I will say, bring me a hoe. Everyone will understand now. But if I speak in Portuguese, traz machad, no one will, no one will understand. Or just some of you. But if you speak Makua, it's my language, that's complicated, too complicated. It's like uh, Jembe. I said everything with Jembe, this one word. Look, bring all these guys together in the same place, try to understand each other, to, uh, to do like a partnership, to achieve something that is really, really complicated. This is my daily work with the different stakeholders. Example that I have here, it's like a, a national, Gile National Reserves, that uh, in Zambeza landscape. The Gile National Reserve is the most important place in Zambeza landscape. But about the exploitation of the trees, the, the guys that are cutting without permission, that has been very difficult to control. And to fiscalize that, to control that, we have to bring all the st stakeholders together at the same place. That's been government, uh, private sector, even the academy. They are, not, they, they are not controlling the place, but give us how we can do that in the field. Before you work in the field, you need the knowledge. Before uh, Jean called me to, to come here to Bonn, I say, really? I am guru now. You want, I have to go to Bonn, living today? I say, yes, please come. That's why I will speak about Gurue because it's like an interactive situation. And this is Mozambique first. And like I'm showing the, 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 the maps here, Gurue is uh, in the south of uh, Zambezia. If you heard something about Gurue tea, the tea that uh, Isabel, uh, Princess Isabel that she was taking on a long, long time. That tea comes from Gurui. And we also have there the Monte Namuli. It's a very, very important hot spot for us. The, the spring rivers that come from us, they give water for almost nine districts inside the Zambeza landscape. That's why it's important, Gurui is important for us. So the, the, the different uh, program that we are running, the forest scheme is the one of them. With the forest scheme, we give opportunity to guys, not only to plant trees, but also to win something with that. We pay per performance with this program. All, uh, all the guys that want to plant trees, they, they are open. We don't have like a, a just a community or just a uh, private sector, no. All the guys, they can plant, but we pay according to the criteria we established for the project. Like as 50% of the cost we pay for these guys without any, any charge. And another program, and the, another important thing here is the restorations. In Mozambique, in Zambeza landscape, farming is next to the river. That is the culture. Not what we thought is the culture. If we want to change that, we have to start now. And the restoration is a way to go. I will give you example of this uh, next program. These two pictures, 
The first one is where I was working with the farmers when John called me. This is here. This is a cabbage that the farmer is producing next to the river. And another picture is the, another farm that's trying to clear to do another field to grow crops. This is the situation that I showed in the, in, the, in the previous slide, show that the farmers, they think that all the nutrients are uh, next to the river. This is wrong. It's a, it's a wrong thought. But we need to, to change that because they already degraded the land. That's why we are implementing also another program that is agroforest. But in agroforest, we cannot put on the same place that we put the cabbage. On this place, we do the restoration that I, sh I showed you in, in the previous uh, slides. And we give example of another land, for example, on this place here that he did a slashing barn, we give, us a, we give the, the communities fruit trees, uh, leguminosae, that, that, that uh, trees that the fix the nitrogen, and we also give seeds, the crop seeds, like maize, beans, and everything. And we teach these guys to do on the same place, to improve the soils, to give us food to eat, and, and another, another thing. Uh, regarding the challenge, this, this is Jewish. The, the challenge is Jewish. If you want to learn something, if you want to improve something, you have to stay with the community, do the same thing that you do all the time. If you want to go to the office and say, guys, let's do it, doesn't work. That's I can guarantee you. I am working with the community almost seven years. For me, it's grateful, and I am, I am happy with that. Opportunity, that's huge. The first one is the most important. If we achieve the, the, the goals that we want with uh, uh, oxygen uh, CO2 captures, the World Bank with another planet will pay us like 50 million. That, that's huge. Not only because of the money, because with this money, we can do another thing. G building capacity with the communities, uh, identify another project that can improve in Mozambique. And of course, Zambezia program is open for partnership. We are, have a lot of challenge there, and we need more help. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Farouk, from Mozambique, <laughs> for giving us a, a little bit of a taste of the work you're doing there. We now move back to another continent, now North America, and I'd like to ask Catherine Kata, <laughs> to give an overview of the Mexico program. Thank you. Um, we have prepared a presentation, and uh, really I want to start with something very uh, important, and that is integrated landscape management in Mexico is a natural solution to the particular land tenure situation we find there. And that is because 45% of Mexico are covered by forest, but 80% of these forests are actually owned by ejidos and communities. This is a land tenure situation that recognizes collective ownership. And now what we see in Mexico is that despite the prevalence of communally owned forest, Mexico's more than 12 million forest dependent, a large share of which are indigenous, are amongst the poorest and most marginalized in Mexico. Um, they lack access to health, education, forest road, water, among many other criteria. And at the same time, they, they directly depend on local natural resources. In addition to that, what we see is that um, deforestation and degradation in Mexico uh, remain to be the main drivers of the country's natural capital loss. And the main reasons for that deforestation and degradation are unsustainable agriculture, uh, forest land exploitation for agriculture, and unsustainable forest management. So what you see in Mexico really is in rural landscapes a lack of livelihood options combined with natural or environmental degradation and loss of environmental services. 
And that leads us really to the need to empower local communities to manage productively their natural resources and to actually benefit from these natural resources. And now there's something very interesting what happens in rural landscapes in Mexico and that is historically the public sector has made a great difference between different land uses. And there's a great differentiation between these different land uses. But really if we go back to the main point and that is communally owned lands, it's one territory. And for the land user it's historically by communal use and traditionally something very natural to integrate different land uses and to really make complementary use of different public programs. And that is really where the World Bank comes in and in Mexico and where the World Bank together with the Mexican government has built a program that brings the landowners to the center of our attention, that looks into providing livelihood, uh, looks into increasing livelihoods, diversify income opportunities through natural resource management, increase income opportunities in rural landscape, increase production, and at the same time, really help communities to maintain and increase the natural resources they depend on. And um, achievements under this programmatic approach have been really diverse and none of this would have been possible without a strong government will to really shift public policy towards an integrated approach. And that's something we need to be very clear and that is the role of the public sector to make integrated landscape management work. And to summarize, some of the things we have managed to do under this programmatic approach, I think the first point would be we learned and we managed with the client, the Mexican government, to look at forests beyond conservation, but towards being forest landscapes a productive sector. And that shift is really important and kind of an idea shift within the Mexican government. And that also taught us that really environmental criteria do not exclude production criteria and increase of productivity in forest landscapes. The second very important point is how do we look at rural, um, uh, rural communities and beneficiaries and actually shifting our views from looking at them at beneficiaries towards entrepreneurs and really seeing rural communities as productive units that can conserve and produce. And the third point I wanted to make within these main achievements is social inclusion. And it maybe sounds a bit redundant talking about social inclusion if you look at communally owned forest, but really it isn't. Because if we look at communities, not everybody in the community has land tenure. Not everybody in the community participates the same way and is able to take the same decisions. So as we want to increase communal land management and empower rural population, we need to look at vulnerable groups. And there I also want to second uh, something that the Mozambique colleagues said, the importance of the dedicated grant mechanism. Because that is really the instrument where we can pilot how to be inclusive in communal owned forest towards those that are vulnerable, young, youth, non-land tenure holders. And one of the and despite all these achievements and what we see, many challenges remain, one of the main being financial inclusion. And I chose that point because it is super important, but also because uh, Eduardo von Findeca was able to come with me here today and to later on present a bit on that. But we need to look at communities, and in Mexico there are thousands of rural communities and thousands of forest communities, but we see that hardly over 10% of these communities have ever accessed credit. And over 90% of these have done so for agriculture activities. So we are looking at an environment where access to finance is 
crucial and it's a main barrier to assure long-term sustainability of the activities we finance. And I already have said the importance of the public sector and it is for the enabling framework to provide incentives to really make the policy. But then we need access to finance for scale up and sustainability. And here Eduardo will take over on that and I just wanted to highlight uh, another detail in that and that is FINDECA where Eduardo is the uh, head. It's a private financial intermediary. And it's a, a financial institution that has implemented part of the FIP funds in Mexico and really channels credit to local landholders. Th thank you, Kata. Uh, <clears throat> this program is going on on 19 states. While you are putting your headset, so Eduardo can please. Venga, uh, señor. Let me just. Un segundo, un ratito. This is, he works in 19. We, we are working in 19 states, so we are having one example because there are many, many projects like this. So, but Eduardo does such a great job. I hope you like it, what you're going to explain to us directly in the co-op. Okay, gracias. Muy buenas tardes. Este, ya estamos cerrando este evento. Eh, agradezco ampliamente al Banco Mundial la, la invitación y muchas gracias a ustedes por estar aquí escuchando la, la participación aquí de los compañeros de, de Brasil y también de los compañeros de Mozambique. Miren, eh, quiero comentarles eh, brevemente la, la experiencia que tenemos en, en financiamiento. Este, eh, eh, agradezco también a las compañeras que van a hacer el favor de, de, de apoyarnos en la traducción. Miren, FINDECA es un intermediario financiero de productores. Es un tema fundamental que lo notemos desde el principio. Es un intermediario financiero de productores. Eh, tenemos 10 años dedicándonos al otorgamiento de créditos a cooperativas de pequeños productores que desarrollan actividades sostenibles en el paisaje forestal. Eh, FINDECA tiene su origen en una organización de pequeños productores que tiene más de 28 años de trabajo productivo en el sector social. ¿Sale? Esto es importante porque es la, la base o es el origen de, de por qué FINDECA tiene una forma un poco distinta de cómo se hace el trabajo tradicional en, el, en la intermediación financiera. Eh, hace 10 años, eh, la CEPCO constituyó a FINDECA con el objetivo principal de contar con un instrumento financiero propio que brindara créditos accesibles a tasas de interés accesibles que fueran oportunos, que fueran suficientes, que fueran ágiles y que fueran para cooperativas que participan en el sector y en el paisaje forestal. ¿Vale? Eh, en México existen una serie de actividades productivas dentro de los paisajes forestales que se desarrollan en diferentes niveles. Algunos son incipientes, otros tienen un desarrollo medio y otro alto. ¿no? Eh, sin duda, para que esto se dé, tiene que haber, en principio, el convencimiento de las personas que van a desarrollar esas actividades de qué es a lo que se quieren dedicar en su vida. ¿no? En segundo término, eh, ahí vamos a requerir un mecanismo de, gubernamental en donde esté incentivando o esté mejorando o fortaleciendo esas capacidades productivas. Y en un tercer momento vamos a requerir eh, el crédito como un elemento que va a potenciar esas iniciativas que van desarrollándose. ¿no? Eh, en México, las actividades que se desarrollan dentro de los paisajes forestales tienen mínimas posibilidades de acceso al crédito tradicional, teniendo como principales causas las siguientes. Cata comentó algunas, seguramente los compañeros este, tienen las mismas. La principal limitante de acceso al crédito es el, eh, la falta de garantías tradicionales. Estamos hablando de giros y comunidades que tienen eh, asignadas ciertas partes de territorio, pero que no pueden darlas en garantía. Por otro lado, hablamos de territorios forestales en donde las distancias normalmente son muy lejanas, hablamos de 6, 8, hasta 10 horas de traslados en caminos que normalmente están muy maltratados. Y por otro lado, hablamos también de falta de eh, capacidades de gestión en esas cooperativas que participan con proyectos en, en esas zonas. Sin duda, estos aspectos son determinantes y nos dan una idea de por qué en esas zonas no hay eh, acceso al crédito formal. ¿Sale? Eh, desde nuestra perspectiva, desde FINDECA, eh, nosotros somos una entidad financiera que somos de pequeños productores y esto facilita mucho la comunicación con quienes solicitan por primera vez un crédito. Eh, nosotros eh, hacemos, o en, en la discusión que tenemos con los solicitantes de crédito, 
hacemos una revisión de por qué hay que integrar un expediente de crédito y le damos sentido a esa lista de documentos que tienen que presentar. ¿sale? Entonces, esa es la base y a partir de un diálogo abierto, de un diálogo este, de tú a tú, vamos encontrando los puntos que se requieren incluir en el análisis de los créditos, de tal forma que las inversiones sean pertinentes, de que las inversiones sean suficientes y de que tengamos los plazos de recuperación que cada proyecto necesita. Eh, en estos 10 años, FINDEC ha otorgado créditos a cooperativas, ejidos y comunidades dentro de los paisajes forestales, basando la operación en cuatro aspectos fundamentales. Uno es el tema productivo, hablamos de cooperativas, que, o de cooperativas o ejidos y comunidades que desarrollen actividades productivas sostenibles y cuenten con productos de calidad. Dos, es el aspecto organizativo. Estamos convencidos de que sin el tema organizativo es imposible trabajar en el medio rural con pequeños este, productores. Ahí buscamos que las cooperativas vayan construyendo sus cuerpos gerenciales, vayan adquiriendo más capacidades técnicas y eh, que la toma de decisiones importantes se haga en asamblea. Es fundamental cuando trabajamos con ejidos y comunidades en el otorgamiento de crédito que toda la asamblea esté enterada de los compromisos que sus directivos van a tomar, si no después es un problema. Y mercado, eh, tenemos que trabajar siempre en que busquen el acceso a mercados diferenciados. Quizás el primer crédito puede tomarse como un crédito básico, pero después tienen que trabajar en la búsqueda de mercados diferenciados, agregando calidad a lo que producen. Hablamos de mercados de madera certificada, de mercados de productos orgánicos, de mercado en comercio o de participación en comercio justo, entre otros. Eh, y por último, eh, la estrategia que en Findeca seguimos es un seguimiento personalizado. Eh, buscamos que cada cooperativa que solicita crédito tenga asignado un ejecutivo o una persona dentro de Findeca que le dé un seguimiento personal a cada cooperativa, enterándose de los problemas que tiene y de las necesidades adicionales de crédito que pudiera tener, eh, discutiendo siempre la pertinencia o no de, de inversiones adicionales. Eh, con estos elementos se han financiado actividades productivas desarrolladas dentro del paisaje forestal, como el aprovechamiento eh, forestal certificado por FSC. Tenemos ahí una lámina en donde vemos un poco eh, lo que hemos financiado desde la extracción del aprovechamiento forestal, eh, la producción de tabla, la producción de muebles y también la comercialización directa de comunidades que se han asociado para tener un punto de venta común. Eh, también servicios este, adicionales como la venta de agua embotellada o los servicios de ecoturismo. Es la verdad. ¿No está? Ahí está, perdón. Teníamos en la anterior la, la parte de café que se ha financiado de forma integral. Eh, se financia desde la renovación de cafetales, el acopio y comercialización, eh, la industrialización y también la venta eh, eh, como producto final. Eh, se tiene una red de distribución a nivel nacional de producto de, de, del café tostado y molido y también se han trabajado para la construcción de cafeterías que lo venden de forma directa al público. Y por último, otro proyecto exitoso también que tenemos es el, eh, la venta de goma de mascar orgánica. Este es el chicle original, antes de que consumiéramos el plástico. Ese es el chico zapote, que es de donde se extrae la resina. Después es el procesamiento que se tiene para la venta en marqueta. Pero esta organización ha avanzado durante muchos años y eh, ahora venden goma de mascar orgánica. Sin duda, todos son esfuerzos que han hecho las cooperativas y en el caso de Findeca decimos que nosotros los apoyamos o los respaldamos con crédito. Eh, por último, eh, en Findeca hemos logrado acuerdos de colaboración con el gobierno de México, con organismos multilaterales y también con el gobierno de los Estados Unidos de, de América, encaminados a atender de mejor manera los proyectos que se desarrollan dentro del paisaje forestal, destacando los siguientes, ya casi termino. Sí. Eh, eh, sin duda... El proyecto del FIP, el, el hecho de que México y, y nos invitaran a, a Findeco a participar dentro del proyecto del FIP, eh, nos ha ayudado mucho a posicionar de mejor manera las actividades productivas en los paisajes forestales. Si no los ponemos este, de relieve, eh, vamos a estar buscando en otras formas la, la conservación de esos recursos. Tenemos que encontrar que en los paisajes forestales se desarrollen actividades productivas que generen ingresos para las personas que ahí viven. Eh, el, el FINDECA junto con el Fondo Mexicano para la Conservación de la Naturaleza participaron como entidades privadas en la ejecución del FIP en México, en la ejecución de una parte del FIP y eso sin duda trajo 
o posibilitó que todo caminara mucho más rápido. Un poco con la experiencia que tenemos en el otorgamiento de crédito, en el hecho de ser o estar constituidos por pequeños productores, eh, facilitó mucho la ejecución, se colocó al 100% la línea de crédito, está toda colocada, eh, se trabajó en temas de asistencia técnica específica a las cooperativas, ejidos y comunidades que tuvieron crédito. En Findeca se formó un equipo especializado para la atención de ese tipo de productos. Esto a su vez nos generó o nos posibilitó un convenio con la CONAVIO, que es la Comisión Nacional para el Uso de la Biodiversidad en México, y estamos trabajando como agente financiero para apoyar con análisis de pertinencias de inversión y en ocasiones con otorgamiento de crédito a cooperativas que traen el mismo espíritu del FIP. Y, eh, y en el caso del USAID, eh, el gobierno de los Estados Unidos está respaldando con garantías las iniciativas de crédito que estemos tomando encaminadas a la protección de bosques mexicanos. Eh, a manera de, ya para cerrar mi participación, les diría que Vemos con mucha esperanza el cambio de gobierno en México, creemos que se va a mantener. Han insistido mucho en que van a estar haciendo inversiones eh, para proyectos sostenibles, esto nos da mucha esperanza. Y en el tema particular de los intermediarios de crédito que participamos en el sector rural, hay una estrategia para la integración de la banca de desarrollo y creemos que esto también nos va a, a facilitar el trabajo. Eh, por último, quiero compartirles dos retos que tenemos en Findeca. Uno es la búsqueda permanente de... Eh, fuentes de fondeo internacionales para que podamos eh, obtener créditos a tasas menores y trasladar ese beneficio en tasa a las organizaciones y cooperativas. Y tenemos un sueño que es la construcción de una banca ética y verde para que nos ayude a avanzar más rápido en estos aspectos. Gracias. Gracias, Eduardo. Uh, to give you scale, so do you don't think this is a very niche boutique one? What you saw, the chiki, the chisa? which is the gum, is available on Amazon. I think Karen won't mind that I'm making a little bit of advertising here, but you can buy this online on Amazon. That means it can't be that small production, and that was one of the advantages of having a co-op doing this. Uh, and there is certain quality built in. Thank you, everybody. I think we all saw, I'm gonna use here so you can, maybe if you have a question, you can use this one as a rover. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. I think what you saw today, the three, them, the three main countries you, you saw that is a complex idea. Uh, you have many programs, many projects, many different instruments, and all we want to do at the end is deliver one single quality, well-managed landscape, which improves livelihoods. And sometimes you need more, la more land restoration, sometimes you need more protection, sometimes you need more agriculture, but the end game is having sustainable landscapes for production and conservation that improves livelihoods. That's the common thread of all three. And we invited the three partners from the field because they bring completely different perspectives. One more on the fire risk, government planning, you know, jurisdictional work, which was the work in Brazil. You have more on the community work, but led by the government with Farouk and also one that comes with the communities, with the private sector, because we can't just see that the communities always have to be small and not, if they, if they organize themselves, if we can help organize themselves, they can do great things. You saw an idea, but you haven't seen it physically, but the quality of the product, it doesn't have to be shabby just because it's, it's a community. They can do good quality products if they receive the right support and technical assistance. And I think that's the three examples here. So I'm very thankful for your presentations. And <clears throat> I think we have some time left, so I'm taking this mic in the podium, just that if you have any questions, please, uh, to our, on your comments to our presenters, please go ahead. I hope you do have a question. <laughs> uh, Laura has the phone, uh, the, the, the microphone here. Over there. Hi, um, I'm Dorothea from Fauna Flora International. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I just have a general question that may be more applicable for the Brazil and Mexico example, but I'm just going to leave it open. <laughs> um, how important is in your, in your various projects, um, 
is the concept of zero deforestation when you're trying to implement sustainable agriculture. So are you aiming for that or are you aiming for something that is uh, better than what is the, the sort of the baseline, the standard? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can get three questions and then we, we open up for the responses. Thank you. Uh, let me ask a question on Mozambique. Um, I just wanted to understand the role of a protected area in the planning of the landscape. Is that like the core zone uh, around which you do your activities? And then I have a question on, for Mexico. And it's really try to understand better the financial way you are supporting your uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs. So, for example, how much is the interest rate? Uh, what is the rate of uh, um, success that you have uh, or, or failure in terms of paying back? And um, how many years you had of, uh, of working with them? I'm Paul Agostini from the World Bank. Okay. <laughs> we have a third one on the back, and then we open up uh, for the responses. Keep thinking on the responses, OK, guys? We don't have enough time, so. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Philip. Um, I'm from Brazil. And I'm starting to work more towards agri uh, regenerative agriculture with this integral approach. And I would like to ask, and this is for all, uh, either in Brazil and the other countries, um, when you approach the community, how are you guys bringing in the, the techniques or the new technologies, how you, you see the necessities without changing like too much their structure? Like, okay, they extract in some way, but they could enhance it. And so this, the capacitation process, and what, are, what is the lenses and what are the tools you are using to approach the landscape? So if it's, there is a hill, if you have a, a permaculture approach, if you have like a, a, you look to the waters, what are the main things you look for to adapt to that landscape and, and strive towards like a sustainable business from it? Thank you. Uh, I'll give you the floor. You make the, floor enough, the final question. I think that will be enough for them to. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. My name is um, Anselm Ducho from uh, the German GIZ. And one of the partners you, you mobilized for, for FIP in Brazil, particularly, we are taking the opportunity to, to say we, we are we're proud to be part of this experiment and uh, this, this um, uh, initiative in, in Brazil. We, uh, we will be implementing the next generation of FIP projects, FIP uh, landscape, um, together with the um, uh, the Forest Service and the Agricultural Ministry. And I think it's, um, uh, it's very impressive, actually, in all these countries, how you manage to, to mobilize partners uh, to, to, to join in in these integrated approaches in, in, in the landscapes and to enhance the, the national policies also, uh, including rural credit, if I understood, in it's, it's part of the Mozambican approach and, and, and also in Mexico and in Brazil, I, I know for sure, because lots of resources are channeled through, through rural credit. So I think this is quite, quite impressive and a feature among all these uh, FIP projects. Um, I have a very simple question. I mean, there's so many to learn from each other already in these three countries. Is there a mechanism within FIP? I don't know who, who, can, who is able to, to respond to them. Maybe the moderator, Garo himself, to, uh, uh, that allows you to, to exchange and to do knowledge management through all these uh, uh, countries. I mean, uh, for example, Mexico, the experience with the traditional populations and, and, uh, and communal land rights is most relevant for our work in Brazil. And, and I think we find uh, lots of themes where we could uh, exchange best practices and all that. Thank you very much. I'm not a speaker, so I'm not going to respond. I'll respond to you later. But GLF is one of the instruments. We have to think about how we can use GLF better to share not only among ourselves, but also with everybody else. Like we're doing here, maybe we can do this more systematically like a separate, uh, like a session here. That's what we're trying to show here, that maybe we can do that uh, for others as well. 
uh, in other situation more organized. You're leaving? But she needs to take a Oh, Janina has to go to, she's gonna, she, this was a dry run, she has to go to COP. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so we have we have a question. Let's let's go over the questions. We have the question about whether how you look at the forestation if it's only to decrease the forestation or all reverse. Uh, there was a question whether we anchor you anchor your programs around protected areas. How important is the protected area as part of your your planning? Those two together are more or less the same question. Who wants to take that question first? Uh, I think Mozambique. You have your mic, you can go yes, ahead. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, for the protected land, we still maintain as, as protected land, but the most important thing is to, to give us opportunity for the communities to know how they can manage that protected land. Because inside the Mozambique law, we have a limitation to use a protected land. We have like a territorial planning, that show us the place, even on the same, on the same maps for, 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 for the protected areas, we show the place that the community can use. But the most important on this, to show the community how they can use this, this part of the forest. Because internally we have like a multiple use, for example. We can't just leave the community because it's a multiple use, we leave it to, to cut, it's a multiple use. We have to show them how they can use sustainable these lands to maintain the forest and even the resource inside the, the reserve. You want to complement it? Yeah, just to add a few things specifically on the Zambezia program. I think it varies from landscape to landscape. Um, in Zambezia, the Gilet National Reserve covers two districts of the nine districts. Uh, what the program did was actually to create a mini landscape around the, the, the Gilet National Reserve. So the program supported the creation of a committee, a multi-stakeholder committee, that looks at the landscape around the buffer zone, but a bit beyond the buffer zone. And at the same time, there was created a thematic group on the Gelan National Reserve within the general um, multi-stakeholder landscape platform. That's completely different in other landscapes. For instance, um, FIP also has money um, in a government program in Kirimbas, up north where it's a much bigger area that has you know, a seaside uh, and also the land side. And all the districts, the seven districts of the landscape program are districts around the conservation area. So the role of the conservation area is much bigger. And one of the main things that is financed in terms of spatial planning is actually looking again at how the, the limits of the reserve and how it's managed with different zones that allow for different uses. So I think my main point here is, is different according to the landscape, but yeah, it's very important in both cases. Uh, maybe, uh, Bernadette, you can give the example of Brazil, because in the case of Brazil, it's not technically a IUCN protected area category one, two, or six, because it's not a private, it's not a public land, but there is an area that is designated for protection inside private areas, and that, I think, uh, you can maybe explain that angle, which is different. Uh, we have here in the room uh, one of our partners that it's SENAR. SENAR is the National Training Technical Assistance for Agriculture. So these guys are in the field. They have a methodology to identify each property, what is the kind of production, what is the technology that they could improve without open new areas. So that's the idea, it's not to uh, prohibit new areas for, for agriculture, but increase the areas that are already on, on use. So they have a special way, they put the guys in the field, they have a technical people that it's training to uh, increase the capacity for, of production using low carbon agriculture. So each property has one assessment, one mapping system, one plan for the next years. And the technical assistance is specific for each project. And the idea is uh, each pro we, we will put many different properties, each one with a specific uh, assessment and technical assistance to guarantee that uh, the total amount of the area, it will be analyzed uh, in the land use system using INTI, that it's the National Research Institute, that it's really, 
help us to provide the, the land use for each of the river basins that we are working. So we are using uh, scientists to analyze. You are using scientists in the field with technical assistance to provide the right technology for each property. Uh, and the Brazil, the Cerrado, the deforestation is still allowed it. So what we need, it's not to say that it's not allowed it. What we want is to prove that they don't need more areas. They need to produce better using the same area. And at the same time, they need to reforest areas that are being uh, opened in a legal system. That, that's the policy in the government. And it's working quite well in the Cerrado because the, the, the producers are being part. It's not, uh, they join the process. It's a voluntary process. So we are working with the guys that want to be better and want to be, produce better using the same area. We also have one of these producers sitting at the table. He's one of the important partners in the Minas Gerais. Uh, <coughs> Eduardo, uh, about the credit, we talked about the credit before, and what are the challenges, and Paula asked the question, if you can see it, come on. Dos, dos puntos. Eh, creo que si, si encontramos o si todos hacemos el esfuerzo por eh, visualizar las capacidades productivas que están en los paisajes forestales, podemos ir encontrando eh, la, la salida al problema. ¿no? O sea, si, si no tenemos paisajes productivos, paisajes forestales que sean productivos, vamos a tener siempre el mismo problema. Entonces tenemos que, que ver, y hay iniciativas de los eh, productores en ese sentido, hay muchas iniciativas, el tema nada más es cómo podemos acercarnos un poco y acompañarlos para que vayan saliendo adelante. Y el punto del compañero, no sé si me adelante, pero cuando se trabaja con ejidos y comunidades o con cooperativas que a veces inclusive eh, tienen una presencia en muchas comunidades o muchos ejidos, como es el caso de, de los productores de goma de mascar orgánica, que son más o menos eh, como 28 cooperativas e inclusive están en dos estados de la, de, del país, eh, permiten que cuando haya que tomar alguna decisión respecto a alguna innovación tecnológica o hacia alguna modificación en cuanto a técnicas de producción, se discuta y se pueda visualizar el alcance que eso puede tener. Uh, Eduardo, and how about the, the rate of return? You think this is competitive? Uh, la tasa de retorno. La tasa de retorno. Es competitiva. Uh, is this a competitive for, for different ones, for wood, or for coffee, and for... Chicle, I mean, sí. would that be something that the market wise and how long does it take for to start making profit? Which is the question, I, I added to your question and because I know sí. where you're going. Sí. Preguntó si hay fallas en el repago. Sí, eh, no, en temas de recuperación de crédito, eh, tenemos el 100% de recuperación en estos mecanismos. Eh, y no es porque sea un tema milagroso. O sea, de hecho, la recuperación es... Eh, mayores o los, los problemas mayores en recuperación de crédito es cuando usamos el, más o menos de lo que nosotros financiamos como el 80% tiene que ver con este tipo de proyectos. Colocamos aproximadamente 34 millones de dólares por año en créditos y el 80% va para este tipo de iniciativas. Hemos financiado proyectos de agricultura tradicional en donde la garantía es un tema convencional, es un terreno, es una casa, y normalmente ahí es donde tenemos esos problemas. Cuando hablamos de, de proyectos sostenibles en el medio ambiente, normalmente están dirigidos a un mercado específico, a un mercado diferenciado, y el seguimiento personalizado que hacemos en FINDECA va cuidando que esos puntos se vayan cubriendo y, y vamos minimizando el riesgo de una manera efectiva. Eh, nosotros establecimos con la mayoría de los productores que vimos ahorita, que son productores de pimienta orgánica, de chicle, de miel, de café tenemos un mecanismo que le llamamos sesión de derechos de cobro. Entonces, nosotros les damos una línea de crédito que es amplia, la gente va disponiendo lo que va, lo que va ocupando para la realización de sus actividades, eh, tienen un contrato para venta y el comprador final hace el depósito directo a Findeca para la recuperación de créditos, 
Entonces, eh, hacemos que el crédito sea muy natural, que eh, no se excedan en temas de recuperación y por lo tanto el costo financiero se, sea el óptimo y al finalizar, cuando se concluye el tema del crédito, cuando está liquidado al 100%, eh, las sesiones de cobro fin, finales que lleguen se liberan en automático al acreditado. Esto es un mecanismo que es muy rápido, muy ágil. Después de una disposición inicial de crédito, las siguientes basta con la firma de un pagaré y al día siguiente tiene los recursos. Cuando tenemos nosotros los pagos, que muchas veces son en dólares, eh, la, la aplicación es, en cuanto recibamos la instrucción para el cambio a la moneda local, se efectúa el cambio, se aplica el crédito y se pueden liberar enseguida. Entonces, el, el mecanismo ágil hace que la gente tenga mucha confianza en estos procesos. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question, if you don't. Uh, Bernadette, maybe you could explain uh, why it's important for, to have the environmental compliance to cadaster. What happens if you don't cadaster? And what happens if you cadaster, but you don't have the 20% or 30% that should be protected? Because when she's talking, it's 20% is the minimum, but you also, you cannot You, you, cannot, uh, you also have to protect margins of rivers, steep slopes, etc. So that could go to 30, 40% of your property. So what happens if you don't have it and why people should cadaster? Okay. Uh, the first forest code in Brazil, it's from 1964. It's quite a old one. In this forest code, they defined the minimum area that each private property need to have on natural vegetation. And it's changed from Amazon, from Cerrado, Atlantic Forest, and in, in, in Amazon it's 80%, uh, Cerrado it's around uh, 20 to 35%, depends on if it's in Amazon region or if it's in POE state, there is additional loss at the state level. And in, in Atlantic Forest, is 20%. So that's the law. That's the national law. During 40, almost 50 years, the law was in place, and no one takes care. So after 10 years discussing the Congress, the new forest code that it was enacted in 2012 established new procedures. They decided to establish the Hoover Environment Cadaster, meaning each property needs to be uh, mapped, define where is the protected area in, within the properties, meaning legal reserve or areas that protect the rivers and the slopes. And they need to define. They define the June 28th, 2008 as uh, the date for the, the limit. So the areas that were cut before this, this date uh, is kind of, uh, that's okay, they can stay in the system. Uh, the areas that are cut after this date, they need to be a forest uh, for the legal reserve. But if it's around the rivers, they still need to reforest if they cut. It doesn't matter if it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or 50 years ago. So what the government did, they established the rural environment cadastre that it's the system to identify. They defined the, a deadline that all the pri private properties in Brazil need to be uh, registered in the system and we are talking about 5 million private properties, so it's a huge system. Uh, the, the, the technology system, it's really a quite big one, a, a strong database. Uh, and with this information, the forestry service that is responsible to monitor the system, if the, the owner don't have, if he or she doesn't have the the total amount that, that it's mandatory, they, they will need to plan how to recover for the next 20 years. So they need to have a plan to recover that, the area that were illegally the forest. And that's the stage that we are now. Uh, they have the information, the data is in the system, and now they start to establish what will be the procedures 
and the agreements to recover these areas at the next 20 years. That's the PRA, that it's uh, Plano de Recuperação de Áreas Degradadas, uh, Degraded Plan for Restoration. Uh, for, yes, plan. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of acronyms linking with uh, compliance. CRA, uh, PRA, it's, it's quite complicated. So, they will need to have this, and they are working for uh, the Brazilian government. They will need to support the small landowners, so it, they need to to provide assistance for these guys that are small producers, family producers, and for the medium and the large, they need to uh, put the money to do this, and the government will check if they are doing well or not. And you need to be registered in the cadaster to get credit when the deadline is not. Yes. So, so there is a, it's voluntary, but not so much. If you're not registered, <laughs> you don't get credit in the bank to make your, uh, your plant. So this is a project that protects in the private area what is there, and also has to invest on land restoration on the area that has already been cleared and it should have not been cleared. But it's more on the private sector because the protected areas in Cerrado only amount to 8% of, of, of the Sahara. And the other thing is, is, is you can build corridors. Uh, I was gonna ask a question to Farouk, but Andre, you have a question. Um, yes, I, I want to, re, um, I'm Andre Kursen, uh, former colleagues here, great to hear. Uh, I want to refer back to how uh, Karen actually made a great um, uh, pitch for the session, uh, I think yesterday at the plenary, when you said that this session will demonstrate how the pragmatic approach is mm -hmm. you know, an answer or the answer to, you, you can have various entry points in, into what you want to address, but it all uh, ends up at a landscape where you want to have a synergetic effect. And the presentations today, the three countries that we've heard, uh, I mean, obviously the Mexican case, they already have this some infrastructure for aggregating and kind of pulling together the various inputs coming from, from the different angles, but I'm not sure I fully heard if there are traces of the similar phenomenon, kind of synergetic phenomenon that you are addressing in, in, in the Mozambique case, or whether it's this multi-stakeholder forum or platform which is this instrument where you know all different inputs, little, little rivers of inflows of resources come to make a synergetic impact at the landscape level uh, or, or, in, on, or in Brazil. I mean, essentially, the programmatic, uh, programmatic approach to landscapes, is it singularly kind of servicing the convenience of the World Bank just to, to lump several projects together under one board approval? Of course, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I'm, uh, or, or it's something that once in place and uh, being implemented for a while becomes a legacy that other and hopefully bigger investments can also use to, to plow resources from different angles into a singular landscape. So that's that's a, more for a question. Let's, instead of a bank staff asking, answering, Farouk, it's up to you, Farouk. <laughs> I don't know if Você, I <laughs> Ah, okay, okay, <laughs> now I understand, thank you. No, that, that is, a, like I'd say uh, previously, that's the experience that we already have. The World Bank just came, came to strength the, the thing that we, we already, we have been doing for, for the previous year. That's good because the, the World Bank gave us opportunity to put together all the stakeholders, more stakeholders that we, we, we didn't, we didn't bring together previously. I think this is the most important thing that we have. And that is important because it's not just for now. We already start, but with the new uh, stakeholders inside, we can keep going because inside, that's the, the, the most important guys there, the academy. They can write for us, they can teach us to take uh, forward all this, move forward in those, all these projects. And some of the tools, uh, I believe some of the tools are now being incorporated in your official planning. Exactly. Right? Uh, we have uh, different tools now. For example, in the agroforest system, we didn't have uh, like a monitoring system, for example. 
we, we now have that, we produce that, and we will be using for, for, for the next three or four years with World Bank, with the partnership with World Bank, but inside the government, they also start doing that. Another example, it's a link channel. We also are creating a, 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 a database that we, we start doing with a Millennium Challenge account uh, project. I think it was five, six years. We, we improved that and we also keep doing it until now. Yeah. Uh, May just to clarify, perhaps I, I forgot to mention. Brazil has the PP Cerrado. That's a national plan to prevent and to avoid deforestation in Cerrado. Yes. This is an umbrella policy uh, that it was established first time in 2010. We are in the third phase of the project. Bank is supporting to monitor this. And this umbrella is putting together uh, public policies for protect and avoid the deforestation in Cerrado. So, uh, the bank support is following this, this large public policy, uh, and this public policy, it's not an environment policy, it's really a national policy. The NEDC, the climate change policy, all the, the political policies that the bank, uh, the Brazil is uh, commitment, commitment uh, through the, the conference are part of this policy, so we are following a national idea to avoid the deforestation and to better produce in Cerrado Bayama. And that's the, the umbrella that is supporting our work. Okay, Carla, you want to say something? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I think I just, I wanted to come back to some of the questions that were made earlier and in, in particular the question on what impact is the landscape. And I think in our particular case, we go there back to social organization because one, we can define a landscape by geographical and environmental by criteria, but really, if we want to make it work on the ground, a landscape is there where the people think a landscape is. And where I do have the social organization for them to work together and to really implement productive and conservation activities. And that is how in Mexico, the first level of organization is really the community, or it could be people within the community dedicating them to one activity. And this is a bit where for the World Bank, there was a huge challenge and that we now have been able to incorporate in our program is recognizing the different type of beneficiaries we can have that range from non-land tenure holders to land tenure holders to communities, but also pr to productive organizations and then to organization of communities. And as they diversify their activities, do we need to diversify the type of beneficiaries we recognize? And how do we reach out to them? Again, needs to be addressed differently according to the different beneficiaries we want to address. I want to have a final question. Hopefully you can give a quick answer, Eduardo and Farouk, because you're in the field. You are our partners in the field. What difference did it, does it make a difference that we were doing a pro, you were doing a project as part of a programmatic approach? Or would it have been the same if we were just doing as a separate standalone project? Would that have been the same thing for you? Or being part of the programmatic approach brings benefits or challenges? Is that any difference for you guys? Okay. Not for us, but for you. Uh, <laughs> with our program, I think make make a lot of difference. Because uh, it's first, it's more flexible. It, it's a long term. Uh, it's a long term program. It gives us more time to to interact, to have more results inside the field. That that is the most important. And 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 another thing is, we are talking about the long term, long term goals. If you, you are working on in integrated landscape, for example, in Zambezia, integrated landscape. It's not with one project that will have the results. It's, it's like a program. We have to run a program with different approaches inside to have all this, to achieve all these goals and the result. And another thing is, with different parts that we are acting now, we can bring together different ideas to achieve one, one goal that we want. For me, that's the, the most important. Eduardo, ultima palabra. <laughs> Sí, perdón por tanto movimiento. Eh, 
En el caso del programa, nosotros, eh, la, la virtud que le vemos al, al hecho de que se pueda hablar de un programa en lugar de un proyecto, es que efectivamente podemos ir haciendo modificaciones en el camino y tenemos un largo plazo para la ejecución. Eh, algo que es fundamental, que acompañe al crédito, es la asistencia técnica. Eso es fundamental. Y la forma en que se planteó eh, con el Fondo Mexicano para la Conservación de la Naturaleza permitió, y de hecho hubo mucha apertura, para hacer pequeños ajustes en lo que se planteó inicialmente. Entonces, inicialmente se planteó un equipo de asistencia técnica integral que fuera acompañando a las diversas iniciativas que tuvieran crédito. Pero en el camino encontramos que había ejidos o comunidades que tenían necesidades de una o dos aspectos de asistencia técnica específico. Entonces, se trabajó en eso, porque lo que no requerían era el tema del equipo integral, sino en dos o tres aspectos específicos que al mejorar ese punto eh, habría o detonaba pues, un avance significativo importante. Entonces, este, y eso lo podíamos hacer porque teníamos un plazo de ejecución largo. Entonces, eso nos ayuda mucho pues, a, a poder planear y a corregir algunas cosas en el camino. Well, thank you. I know we can all have questions here, but uh, we are running out of time. So, first, a big round of applause for all our speakers. Thank you.